So, um, uh, yes, my name is Heidi McDonald. I am the editor-in-chief of the Beat at ComicsBeat.com. So it's my distinct honor, I don't even need to be close, it's my very distinct honor to be here talking to Trina Robbins, who is my mentor. Uh, Thank you. Uh, very much inspired me, guided me, helped me, um, and led the way to do that for a lot of people, I think. And as a historian, has been uh, an invaluable contributor. I don't know which side of Trina is more important. Her groundbreaking cartooning and editorship of women's comics, the first ever female anthology of comics, or first ever female anthology of comics was it ain't me babe oh that's right that's right see she's going to correct me i was going to say as a historian the her historian who has done so much to bring forgotten artists uh and their work back to light uh and no one else has done it (laughs) oddly enough for reasons maybe we'll get to um but anyway please join me in welcoming the one the only the legend trina robbins thank you So Trina, um, I, I've thrown together, not like your own inspiring slideshow, so just a few images to just oh, kind of, yes. to just sort of spark our conversation. So this is the, the women's crew, but before we get to that, I want to know, and I don't think I've ever asked you this, so what comics did you read as a child? Um, okay, I started on books for younger readers. Um, that was at the point where my mother was still getting me comics. So like Our Gang, Raggedy Ann, I think these were all gold key comics. And they were, they were the ones that were considered okay for kids. Uh, but as soon as I was old enough, you had to cross two streets to get to Itsky's candy store that had the revolving rack that said, hey kids, comics. Mm-hmm. So as soon as I was old enough to cross two streets on my own, I was getting any comic, really, that starred a female character. And that included timely comics, which later became Marvel, had us just scads of girl comics. girls. Uh, comics in which the heroines were teenage girls, like Patsy Walker, um, Kathy, Margie, uh, Millie the Model, um, just they all had girls' names, and I bought them all, because teenage girls didn't read, really read these comics. It was the younger, it was the tweens who read the comics, and, because 10, 11 year old girls adore teenage girls. But did you, did you read like, uh, did you read Wonder Woman at all? I did. As soon as I discovered Wonder Woman, I added her to the pantheon of comics I was reading. And you know, talk about, just she totally opened my mind. I had not known that there were Amazons. Uh, and the thought of this, of a magic island, uh, <laughs> that where there are no boys allowed? I mean, wow, you know, I grew up at a time when no girls were allowed in so many things, when it was understood, without even saying, that we couldn't be president. It was taken for granted. They always said anyone can be president, but it wasn't true, you had to be a boy. Mm-hmm. Well, was your, was your, um mother influential to you? I mean, I can't imagine that you encountered any of these obstructions and took them lying down. I mean, what was your, what was your inspiration? Heidi, you are asking such leading questions because you know the answers. (laughs) My mother was a teacher, a second grade school teacher, and she taught me to read when I was four years old. And aside from giving birth to me, it's the greatest gift that anyone has ever given me because, boy, did I take to reading. I mean, talk about opening a new, a whole world. It opened a world for me. And I read everything. I didn't just read comics. I read all the books in the house. My mother, when I was too young to get a library card, my mother would get books out of the library for me. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, uh, so when... Did you want to be a cartoonist, you know? Oh, well, I always drew, you know? I probably was drawing before I even knew how to write. Um, But when you're really young, it doesn't occur to you that these things are drawn by real people, you know? They're just comics, aren't they wonderful? Um, I do remember uh, there's this thing that you can do back in the days before scans. Uh, You take a candle 
and you rub it on a piece of white paper so that the paper is coated with wax, then you put it over the panel you want and you rub that down and it transfers the picture to the piece of paper. I remember doing so that exciting. with panels I really liked. And there were certain artists, Wally Wood was one of my favorites. Um, and he was the only one whose name I knew because mm -hmm. he used to do his name in that, those huge, big gothic letters. I loved the way he drew women. Yeah, yeah, he was, he was great. But so, I mean, did you, I mean, later in your career, which we'll get to, obviously you discovered all of these women who actually were doing comics during this whole period. But I mean, was there an inkling that this might be something you would do for a living? Or was this just like, I'm just going to keep drawing? And no, it never occurred to me that I could actually draw comics. Although I used to draw my own comics. I would take my wonderful mother again, would bring me home reams of eight and a half by 11, um, Board of Education paper. It had, it had that watermark. You could hold it up and it would say Board of Education on it. Yeah. And she'd bring it home to me. And I would simply fold it in half and I'd have four pages and I would just pencil in a comic. So yeah, I was drawing comics. I think, I think by the time I was 11, I was drawing comics. Right. So, um, so we'll fast forward a little bit. So to the East Village Other. Mm -hmm. 1966. Yes, I don't have a slide for that, but this was a, you know, the, the hippie era was about to blossom. And it was blossoming, yeah. it was blossoming. And what were you doing? Well, I was, I was living in LA, actually. Uh, I was married, I was making clothes for rock stars. We were hanging out with rock stars on the Sunset Strip. We were such good friends with all these people that we <laughs> never had to pay to get into any of the clubs. We just walked in and they knew us. Um, and, you know, it, wow, those were great times. And then one day, when we had an underground newspaper, it was um, the Free Press, the LA Free Press. But it was a little more staid, if you can call any underground newspaper staid. <laughs> and it was, it was rather political, of course, in a very extremely radical way, but very political. Um, and then one day somebody showed me a copy of the East Village Other and said, look what's coming out of New York. And it was completely different. It yeah, was New York. <laughs> <laughs> it was psychedelic, it was anarchistic, it, was, uh, it looked like there wasn't one straight line in the entire newspaper, and it had comics. Now, I had already started getting interested, you know, okay, so I had gobbled up comics as a kid, but when I hit high school, my mother said to me, comics are kid stuff, you really should stop reading them. You're a teenager now. And I did. She didn't have to force me. I did. I was a good daughter. I thought, oh, you're right. And I gave away, you know, my, my collection, which today, of course, would be worth hundreds of thousands of dollars, gave them away to the neighborhood kids. And I stopped reading comics, except with exceptions. When I was 15, I discovered EC Comics and Mad, of course. You know, right. for me, it was like Mad isn't really even a comic. It's so different. Um, but then, so in the 60s, um, Batman was on television, and pop art was really a big thing. So I started getting interested in comics again. And around 65, somebody told me, oh, you should see these new comics coming out of Marvel, the Fantastic Four, and oh, the Hulk, he's so great, you know, he <laughs> turns into this big green creature. And that was really cool. It was something new. Um, so I was already into comics, right. and I thought, reading these new, these, and they were new, the Marvel, right. it was like a renaissance, the Marvel comics. I tried to do one myself and failed miserably because I'm not a superhero artist. And what I, in those days, that's what was coming out were superhero comics. So it didn't occur to me to try to do something <laughs> that wasn't a superhero comic. What were, the, what were the comics that were in the East Village Other at that point? Well, that's it. Then I saw yeah. the comics in the East Village Other and they were different. All right, there was one that was in strip form called Captain High. <laughs> and, yeah, so, you know, that'll tell you right there. And uh, the art wasn't that good, but it was funny and it was different. And, but what struck me the most was this full page comic, totally psychedelic comic called Gentle's Trip Out. And it really was a trip out. And you know, it didn't necessarily make sense, but it was cosmic with a K, you know, mm -hmm. and a Z. <laughs> um, 
and it was signed Panzika. And it took two years for me to find out that Panzika was a woman named Nancy Kalish. So you could say that my first inspiration was a woman cartoonist. Mm -hmm. Oh, Panzika, um, another forgotten woman mm -hmm. of comics. Um, so you moved, so, you, so did you do comics for the East Village Other or? Yes. Yeah. yeah, I moved to, well, I was splitting up with my husband. It was, it was kind of a no fault breakup. You know, I just kind of outgrew the situation. Um, I felt very bad about leaving him, too, because he's a nice guy. I have nothing bad to say about him. But I moved to New York. I moved to the Lower East Side, and it was very exciting. Not that LA wasn't, I mean, the Sunset Strip was amazing, but it was a completely different scene, except that they both were, you know, the new hippie, the new counterculture. Um, and almost immediately, I met the Evo people. I met uh, Walter Boart and Alan Katzman, who were the editor and publisher. Um, and that's because a friend of mine from the Sunset Strip was the managing editor of these Village Others, so I looked her up. That was Eve Babbitts, who became a writer. She's pretty mm. comparatively well known. Right, if you yeah. Know I've that. Heard of yeah. Um, so I met them, and I did a a drawing just on my own, just as a kind of a little note. I don't want to get into this whole, you know, how I got inspired to do this drawing and slip it under their, their uh, door, because that's in my memoir. <laughs> and so I'm going to be reading that when my memoir comes out. Yeah, so there, there we go, which I eagerly, eagerly awaited. As you can tell, there's a lot of mem to war in here, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Summer 2017. <laughs> yeah. OK, uh, but anyway, I did slip this little drawing, which was kind of like almost a proto-comic. Slipped it under their, the, the door of their uh, office, because nobody was home at the time. And they published it. Now, I didn't expect it to be published. Mm -hmm. And so that was the beginning of my ha career. <laughs> but I, you know, I think what's, what's fascinating about this is, to me, and you, know, and you and I have talked about this so much over the years, is you know, forgotten women. And you know, I mean, with women's comics, obviously, it was. And with It, it Ain't Me, Babe, um, you know, this is a photo of the women's comics collective you know, with Ron Turner. This was is a 1976. Yeah. Yes. So we and uh, do you see the woman at your far left in a maroon dress or a deep red dress? That is Becky Wilson, who is sitting in the back over there. Oh, uh, where is she? <laughs> Becky, where are you? Over here. She's not in the back at all. Yay! Okay, that's, that's Becky Wilson. One of the original women cartoonists from Women's All Comics. right. Well, this is awesome. So so honored to have, have her here. Um, and that's me peering between mm -hmm. Becky Wilson and Shelby Sampson. That's yeah. me. But I, I, I think, like I said, what's, what's, um, what's fascinating to me about all this is, uh, there we go. So this was, this was your first comic, yes. right? And it was the first, when did this come out? This came out in 1970. And it was the very first all-woman anthology comic book ever. I say that because this one awful writer from New York hedged her bets mm -hmm. when she wrote about it and said, and Trina published one of the first mm -hmm. all-women comics, like, ooh, maybe there was another before. Well, there wasn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I, but I mean, like, you had been inspired by Panzika, so I mean, you knew, and, and you know, Eve Babbitt, so Panzika I mean, is in the, in the. And, yeah. So, I mean, you knew that there were, uh, you know, like, by the time I came along, I mean, just the idea of women, like, if you saw a Trina Robbins, it would be like, you know, oh, how did that happen? You know, and uh, you know, my mother was an artist who actually uh, worked with the yes, yes, Suzu, who was um, in one of Trina's books. But she worked uh, with an early syndicate that you and Lee Mars were involved with. Uh -huh. So you know, it was all in my family. So I didn't have any questions. But but there was always so many like, like girls don't do that. Oh yeah, and girls don't read comics, yeah, of course. I know. Which I knew was total bullshit. You I know. know. I know, but anyway, so, so, uh, but I mean, what was, why did you do it? What was the inspiration? Why did you say, this is what I've got to put my energy towards? Once I started doing it, I really liked what I was doing. I had had a boutique, you know, I was making clothes. Uh, I've always loved clothes, and I couldn't afford to get the clothes I wanted, and it was easier to just make the clothes I wanted, and pretty soon, I had so many ideas and I couldn't wear them all, so I started sewing for other people. And in the Lower East Side, I had a boutique. Uh, but 
and I never lost my love of clothes, of course, but slowly, slowly, um, my love of comics and of creating comics was kind of edging it out. Yeah. So, uh, so was there a lot of? I know um, you loved the, the paper, paper dolls. Paper dolls. I know. Was there? <laughs> I mean, how was it received? You know. Uh, well, you know, the thing is, there were so few underground cartoonists at the time, and the publishers were great. I mean, Evo, you know, I was accepted as part of the family, and they published my stuff. We had a kind of trade, really, because I made clothes for some of them. And in return, they would publish my comic strip, which was actually an ad for my boutique. Uh, but it was so psychedelic that most people didn't know it was an ad for a boutique. <laughs> they just thought it was a wild, weird comic. It was called Broccoli Strip, because my boutique was called Broccoli. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, soon I was doing other comics for them, which they published. It. At one point, they were paying me $20. Wow. You know, which, wow. I mean, that would be like you know, $500 now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when you did it, it Ain't Me, Babe, and, and then which led to women's comics, mm -hmm. right? Um, I mean, I mean, you've talked so much about, uh, you know, your peer group and how there was maybe some pushback on it. Uh, what peer group? <laughs> yeah, it was but, all guys. It was all guys. Um, but why do you think there was so much... Why do you think there was so, so much objection to it? Why was there so much like rejection? Um, well, I think they were threatened. It was as simple as that. It didn't help that around 1968 or 69, I got into what was then called women's lib. Um, and they were very threatened by women's liberation, extremely threatened. Um, and um, it really, you know, the worst of it started, well, when I was in New York, it was still okay, you know, Evo published me. I was even sending stuff to the print mint in, in San Francisco, and they were publishing it. Uh, when I moved to San Francisco, there was this tight little group of, it was a clique really, of male cartoonists, and they, it was a definite boys club. I was not invited into their boys club. Um, I was not invited to their parties. Um, <laughs> So I was on my own, and that's how I came to work for the first feminist newspaper in the country, and that was It Ain't Me, Babe. At the time, I thought it was the first feminist newspaper in, in the West Coast, but I've since been told by Robin Morgan, who was the editor of Ms. and a very well-known feminist, that it was the first in the whole country, which is really cool. And I think I got in there around their second or third issue and I was doing um, covers and, and a comic on the back page that was not so subtle, feminist propaganda. And I got the idea because I was working with these people and I thought, I can do a comic, we can do a comic. Yeah, and I mean, it, it, is, it is just, um, it's fascinating to me though that, you know, it, what was, you know, and obviously Zap is a huge, very influential, I mean, it's absolutely influenced you know, comics uh, around the world. And, um, and you know, the stuff that was in women's, I mean, but there were so many great artists in there, you know? And I mean, it's taken so long for this work to be recognized. It's as, nice that it is. It is, it is, it is, really. And you know, the, if, in case you don't have it, I mean, the, the slipcase edition is really, you know, it's, it's just as valuable. I was so thrilled when Fanographics finally said they were going to reprint this. It's better because if you have the original ones from the early 70s, you pick them up and they fall to dust in your hands. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. And, you know, you were uh, drawing comics for there and, you know, some of the other cartoonists in there who, uh, of course, I, it's Sunday Con, so I'm not going to even attempt to list them. But, um, you know, it was, it was an amazing lineup of people. Thank you. Yeah. And um, so what, and it lasted for 20 years, yes, right? Yes, it did. Yeah. Were you involved with it for 20 years? Or? Yes, I, I missed maybe two issues. Mm -hmm. Other than that, I was in it every issue. Now, I think, like, the next slide is your... Uh, your opium, right? Yeah. yeah. Now, which is uh, that was a book that never came out. But now it is coming out, right? No, no, it's a completely different book. Oh, okay. But the art could easily be the art for dope, easily. Um, what is coming out in 2017, January, I believe, is my adaptation of a novel by Sax Romer. 
Uh, yeah, I heard somebody go, mm, so that means some people still know who <laughs> Seth's rumor was. He created Fu Manchu. He was a very, very blood and thunder pulp writer in the early 20th century. And this is a, a novel he wrote called Dope, which is indeed about opium dens mm -hmm. and, and, and sexy villainesses who, who wear nothing but robes like that with nothing under them. <laughs> uh, so that could be an illustration for Dope, but it isn't. Right, this right. was a book called opium traffic that never came out, but I did the cover for it. Mm -hmm. So were you obsessed with dope at this point, Rita? <laughs> no, I wasn't. Uh, this book was by someone else. Yeah. It was just, uh, no, and I, I really never had opium. <laughs> I must have to confess. Um, but um, this, I had found this book in 1970 either 1970 or 70, I think 70. I think I found it in 1970. Uh, there was a science fiction and fantasy bookstore in San Francisco, and they were closing, and they were selling the entire contents of the bookstore for a dollar each. So, you know, how could I resist? Right. I mean, you know. Well, what, <laughs> what, you know, what kind of, um, uh, you know, comics were you interested in doing at this point? I mean, you know, because I mean, these were things that were a little more in the pulpish tradition. I mean, it wouldn't be thought of necessarily as underground. Well, Dope actually is not from the 70s. I, mm -hmm. I mean, I've got the book in mm -hmm. the 70s, but I didn't adapt it until 1981 okay. for Eclipse Comics, ah, which was one of, you right, know, part of the right, whole right. black and white craze. Uh, of the 80s, mm -hmm. and they did a magazine that was an anthology book and asked me to contribute, and I was delighted because not everyone was asking me to contribute to their books. Right, right. So yeah, I, as we were moving into the uh, the 80s, I think this is an 80s issue of... Mm. Um, One of my favorite covers. <laughs> I know, it does say it all, really. Um, but uh, yeah, and, and at this time, um, I mean, the whole underground, you know, one of the things about the undergrounds, obviously, was that they were part of the head shops. So, you know, they had this whole distribution system, and then that got closed down. So then it became the comic shop, so it was a different situation. And uh, certainly, the early comic shops weren't a very friendly place for the kind of work you were doing. Is that fair to say? I refer to them as the dread comic shops. Uh, yeah. um, they... It was even hard for underground guys to get, get into those stores. I mean, these were stores that only carried or it specialized in the big two, mainstream comics, superhero comics, aimed at young men and boys. Excuse me. And the, the uh, people who worked there, the managers, the owners, were also, you know, down, they might have been 40 years old, but down deep inside they were 12. Mm -hmm. And uh, they didn't want girls in the shop, and it was very, they were very uninviting places anyway. I like to say they were safe spaces for boys. They were safe spaces for boys. I mean, I mean literally. I mean, I, I, I don't mean that necessarily even in an ironic sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, this was a place where boys could really get into this lame stuff that, you know, no girl would ever. That's right. <laughs> like, no girl would ever, except, That's you know, right. unfortunately, I was into it all, so, <laughs> you know. Um, but at this time, you had, uh, let's see, actually, well, I got it mixed up, but, you know, you did do Wonder Woman. That was 85. You? Right, yeah. so. Yeah, that now, was. Now, uh, I'm not going to get into any controversy about who was the first woman to draw Wonder well, thank Woman you. or write, write Wonder Woman, but you were certainly one of the I was one of the, the first, first, but I was not the first. The first was Ramona Fraden, right. who drew Wonder Woman for Super Friends in 1970, and I have an issue that she signed for me. Mm -hmm. But also, actually, the original Wonder Woman comic. Now a lot has come out that maybe it was co-written by some... Uh... Well, um, people add, put a lot of importance into that. I know that his wife, Elizabeth Marston, was an influence and mm -hmm. suggested things to him, but I do not believe that she actually wrote any of it. Mm -hmm. uh, the whole family helped him. His son, Pete, who is still with us, is a wonderful, wonderful old guy. He used to send plots. He was in college. He would send plots to his father. Mm -hmm. And if his father <laughs> used them, he would pay Pete. Mm -hmm. So it was a family thing. Right, so a family affair. Maybe yeah. one of the wives might have helped, you know, one of the I, array I, of... <laughs> I don't know. I think Elizabeth yeah. probably made a lot of suggestions. Right. But I don't think any of them wrote it. Right. So what was, though, I mean, um, you know, how did you come to do Wonder Woman? Uh. They had, I don't know how many months, four months, six months, um, 
what they did, it was, it was their crisis on infinite earths, which they kind of do this kind of crisis thing periodically, <laughs> you know, because suddenly they're going, oh my God, Superman is 75 years old. That doesn't work, so we'll have to kill him off and have another Superman, you know. And so they kill off the characters and they, they revive them and they bring them up differently and new. And, um, you know, it's also a scheme to sell as many books as possible. So they killed Wonder Woman off. They turned her back into clay, basically. And then, and George Perez was going to do the new Wonder Woman, which was mo quite a bit, quite feminist. Mm -hmm. um, but in the meantime, they had like this, what was it, four issues or six? It was four issues, yeah, right? Yeah, they had this four-month oh, yeah. this four month period, and they needed to fill it. And the way I always envision it is they're sitting around in the office having a meeting and someone says, what the hell, why don't we give it to Trina? You know, <laughs> even if she screws it up, you know, George Perez will take over and it'll be better. Right, right. Were you friendly at all with like Marvel and DC editors at I that time? I knew some of them, yeah. Yeah, so, um, yeah, and, and you know, this, this came out. And, but you were, this is about the time that we met, I guess, because I got into comics in the, in the early 80s. And uh, you know you were fighting. You were fighting to return to, to you girls' know. comics yeah. because I knew that it wasn't true that girls didn't read comics because I had read all those girls' comics when I was a kid, and I wasn't alone. My girlfriends read them too. You well, know, it really you know in this time of of you know media untruthfulness where you can you know state things that aren't aren't true uh, and. It's really hard to prove things are are not true anymore, you know. But I have to say, like, that's one of the things. I I, I just you know when you walk around SPX now and you see oh, you know isn't it amazing fifty fifty or whatever. I mean, it's just no one would even say any either way. Uh, but you know, just how many people told us that girls didn't read comics? Everyone told Everyone. us that. Like I just you know they just don't get them. They just. Like yeah, they just, said that they, they said, said they women don't know they, how to read you know, a comic. You know, women aren't visual. You know, women just don't learn visually, so they, they don't get comics. Our poor little We've brains. tried everything. Our poor little brains just can't fathom the, the panels. Yeah, I know. They can't read the panels. That was another one. They can't follow the story from panel to panel. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, but, you know, the tragic thing is that it wasn't just some ignorant, you know, guy. No, it was editors This is publishers. the editor of, you know, the top books. You know, the most powerful people in comics told us this. So, but, um, but you did get a chance to do Misty, right? Yeah, I convinced Jim Shooter. Luckily, Jim Shooter had started at Marvel writing Millie the Model. So he had a soft spot for mm -hmm. girls' comics. Ah. And, you know, I know... He, there's a lot of negative publicity about Jim, but he has always been to me an absolute darling, really a sweet guy. And so he gave me a six, six issues to do Misty, a book aimed at, at girls. Um, and you cannot imagine the mail, the fan mail that we got. My editor, um, what's her name? No, Cindy, Anna Cindy Anna was my Cindy. editor. Anna she used Cindy. to send me manila envelopes stuffed with mail from little girls. And they mostly said, well, not one of the things they always said was, and they would write the letters to Misty, not to me. Dear Misty, I love your book. There was never a comic for me before, but now there's a comic for me. Oh, and they would send me designs for clothes, which I would use and I would credit them. And they would get a little card. Anne was very good at that. She'd send them little cards that said they belonged to the Misty Designers Club. Uh, but the other thing they always said was, I can't ever find it. I have such a hard time finding your comic. No, I, I see, if you, would, <clears throat> if you would ask me, I wouldn't have remembered, but it was part of the Star Comics line. So this was actually something that Marvel tried in the, in the 80s to be towards kids, because as they went, as comics did go into the direct sales market, you know, they did. The kids and the women who, who you know, who weren't boys, the audience fell off. And the off. gay boys. And the, uh, I had lots of yeah. gay boys. So did you just, 
this was probably <laughs> this was probably sold on newsstands too, right? It probably was one of the last books that was. Uh, I don't going think to so. Alas, I think it was yeah. the time of direct sales. Oh, okay. And the comic stores simply didn't carry it, or they would order like two copies. So the sales on it were not. That's what happened. Yeah. The same thing that killed women's comics in the end was distribution. The dread comic book store didn't want girl cooties. Yeah, yeah. You did a book called California Girls too. Yeah, that, that was, was after Misty right. ended. I mean, he gave me six issues, you mm -hmm. know, as he had promised, but it just didn't sell enough at the time. Today, that would be considered a really oh, good sale. I was gonna, it sold like 20,000. I was probably saying, it was probably yeah, selling like, you know, 20, 20 30,000 copies. So. It did, and today that would be considered fantastic, mm -hmm. but in those days it wasn't enough. Right. Um, so it ended, and so I went to Eclipse. Good old Eclipse, they're so nice. Well, they were so nice, they're gone now. Um, Although Dean Mullaney has edited yeah, my, he, my Miss Fury books and did a beautiful job. But anyway, I went to them with my, uh, my idea of basically doing the same kind of stories, except they're twins and they live in California. Yeah. And I mean, and I've had paper dolls. And you can, I'm sure, find these books in, um, you know, in the back issue bin sometimes. And if you, I mean, if you want like yeah. prime 80s, like, you know, culture, I mean, this is like right in the heart of it. <laughs> Um, you continued as so by then by now you and I were, were good friends and you were continuing always to attempt to bring um, uh, comics for girls back you know kicking and screaming into an industry that did not want it that's um, right yeah I mean go girl is another book you did yes uh, who but put, that was later that was much later yeah. but I know you and Ann Timmons tried I oh mean, again was, it was, what was, it going was still on? Yeah. a distribution problem as late as we're talking now about the late 90s and the early the early 21st century it was still a distribution problem. <clears throat> and we had a lot of fans, and again, because we knew girls liked paper dolls, we always included paper dolls. People would send us in designs, people would send us paper doll uh, drawings. And uh, again, we had a lot of fans who really loved us, but uh, the stores were impossible. You know, they would order like two copies, and you'd go in, you'd look at all their comments, but there was, where's Go Girl? Oh, it sold out. So like your first thought would be, wow, that's great. <laughs> and then you would realize that they sold out the two issues and never reordered. Yeah, yeah. Who published Go Girl? Um, Image. Oh, Amazing that's right, enough. that's right. Um, and I know you did some books for, um, uh, la, la, learner, you did Chicago. Yeah. I didn't have a slide of that, but that That's was more okay. in the arts. You did it. Yeah, that, did... I think that did well. It yeah. was a six, yeah, part you did six part series. I was happy working for Learner, but my editor quit. Yeah, and... Carol <laughs> left. Yeah. yeah, but you were so. I guess during this time, you began to transition to being a writer. Yes, is that fair to say? Oh yeah, a historian. Well, um, I was writing my, I was writing Go Girl, right. and I was writing the Chicago Land series. Yeah, and I was. Definitely, at that point, a historian. Yeah. So this is, I think, the second book yes. you did. Mm -hmm. um, my, my mom's in that book, so I always like to show it. Yeah. But um, but now, did you uh, you started researching like the secret history of comics? And uh, I remember going to a slideshow you did. I think it was at WonderCon, and it was probably the '90s. It must have been right when this book came out. And uh, you know, you did this slideshow where you talked about. Um, you know, Nell Brinkley and Rose O'Neill and Gladys Parker and Ethel Hay. And it's like, I'm like mind blown. You know, my whole life, everyone's told me women don't do comics. You know, women can't draw, you know. Uh, and now there's this whole gigantic history of women in comics. <laughs> so what made you want to do that? Well, I needed to prove because somehow I knew, you know, when I first started researching it, that was for Eclipse, our first book, Women and the Comics. Uh, Cal <coughs> Ironwood and I wrote it together, co-wrote it, and it was because I knew that there had been women drawing comics. I didn't know who they were yet, but I knew, logic told me, that women had drawn <laughs> comics as well as men. And we started researching and we discovered, you know, hundreds of women. And this is before the computer days. It was very hard to do research in those days. A lot of our research was faulty, not our fault, but the fault of the people we did research from that just, you know, that their research was faulty. Right. Um, and it wasn't really until, 
I think this book cleared up a lot of the the miss the, the you know the things that are the mistakes we right, had made right you know yeah I mean but uh, but but what's incredible to me was like people like you know Rose O'Neill who was incredibly successful and you oh, know yeah, was like a celebrity yeah, yeah and I mean she would be like on the society page I mean you know she would be like today she'd be on Instagram and you know like posting pictures of herself all the time and you know with millions of followers but I mean these were really huge and you know not you know just completely obliterated <laughs> from yeah. the history of comics. Because when the guys wrote histories of comics, they just wanted to write about Jack Kirby and Spider-Man, and they didn't care that there had been women drawing comics. As early as, you know, and I have a lot of those early books. There's one by Colton Waugh. Yeah. And I'm sure he was a very nice guy. <laughs> but he devotes, I think, two pages of the whole book to women who drew comics. Mm -hmm. And of those two pages, he publishes something by uh, Virginia Clark, and he is completely unaware of the fact, and this was the 40s, he should have known by then. You know, it was close enough to 1929 and 1930. He should have known that Virginia Clark was also Virginia Huger, who did great flapper strips in the late 20s and early 30s, and then changed her name to Virginia Clark and did comics in the 40s. He should have known this, but he didn't, and he doesn't even mention Virginia Huger, who was incredible, and I had to make this discovery on my own. Well, you know, I, I, this is my favorite example. I'm not, I know this is the Trina Robbins panel, but I'll throw this in just because I know you'll be right there with me on it. Um, and uh, Carla Speed McNeil and I were talking about this, and now I am going to blow it. But, you know, the most famous tarot cards uh, is the Rider Weight Pack. And, you know, these images, like everyone who's seen this is like, oh, it's so cool. It's like the, you know, the tarot card. And, you know, they're so powerful. And it wasn't until later that I realized these were drawn by a woman. And, you know, you'd think her name was Ryder or Wait, but it isn't. Like, like those were the guys who hired her to do this tarot deck. And, you know, like, like I do know her name, but I, it's not on the tip of my tongue. I have, and, you know, so I will look it up. I will Google it, okay? But uh, yeah, she's not, she's not even known as, she didn't even get her name on these, this deck of cards that, that we know so well. And I mean, it's just, it's just mind boggling. Like, you know, and like you discovered, you know, I have up here Nell Brinkley, like you did a whole book about her and you know. I did two books yeah, about two, her. Yeah, and you know, obviously she could draw like crazy, you know. And she was a superstar. Yeah. She, she was probably the biggest star of them all. Yeah, and, and like you talking about these flapper strips, like in the 20s, like there was a lot of these, these art by women yes. that were very popular yes, and, and nobody beautiful thought it was and well weird. done. Yeah. Nobody thought, oh, how strange, a woman is drawing a comic. Nobody thought that. It was yeah. fine. Yeah, yeah. So you, you, know, you went back in and, and you know, put, put a lot of these artists on. And you know, another artist, of course, was Lily Renee. Oh, Lily. Now, and, but also, like she was a fiction house. You know, this was more the mainstream of comics. And, but uh, Fiction House, during the war, Fiction House published more women than any of the other publishers. Um, and one of the ones they published was Lily. I would like to just, I would like to use the bully pulpit here. Those of you who are comics professionals, and the, all that means is you have to have been published in comics, um, you can vote for the Eisners, the, the Eisner, um, which they give out, which are a little, cuter than the Ignatzes, which are just bricks. Um, they give these out at the San Diego Comic Convention um, every July. And there is a Will Eisner Comic Book Hall of Fame. Currently, since they started, there are exactly four women who have been elected into the Will Eisner Comic Book Hall of Fame. I would like to use the bully pulpit to ask you all, who, all of you who are eligible to vote, to please vote for Lily Renee yeah. For the Will Eisner Comic Book Hall of Fame. Yeah. And I mean, she is, uh, you know, I mean, you helped rediscover her. I got to meet her. And, you know, like Fiction House, as you say, did, uh, uh, did hire a lot more women. I mean, there was, you know, guys went to war and they were exactly. like, all right, let's get these girls. Let's get them in their drawing. So, I mean, again, it isn't like, 
you know, this, <laughs> you know, this is funny. All right, this is another one, but just amazing. Like, um, I was writing about Alan Moore, and of course, he was, his new book was influenced by William Blake. And you know, you know, William Blake and his wife, like, she was the printmaker. You know, like they had their own little That's thing. cool, I didn't know that. Yeah, and, and then I was reading about his wife, and it said that, that sometimes she would color them, his work, but she wasn't very good at it. And I'm like, really? You know, like, and I looked, her name was Catherine Blake, and it's really hard to find anything about her, because his mother's name was also Catherine Blake. So, uh, but I'm like, I bet you, I bet you she helped a lot with, with putting out those books and doing his art and everything. And, you know, she probably had a little lot more to do with it than, you know, he was a great poet and artist, don't get me wrong, but, you know, like, again, forgotten. They never get... <laughs> in, the, in the 60s and 70s, and I think well through the 80s, uh, in mainstream comics, a lot of the wives of the mainstream cartoonists would do their coloring mm -hmm. or filling in the blacks, mm -hmm. and they were not, of course, credited for that. Yeah, yeah. I don't no. think they, most, in many cases, most cases, I think they were not paid either. Yeah. They it did was, it for their husbands. It was just like, yeah, well, you got to help out. Well, to put yeah. bread on the table, you know? And, um, I mean, it's interesting, like Ramona that you mentioned, uh, you know, she was, you know, amazing and had an incredible career and still going still, gangbusters. Oh, yeah. oh still going. if you get a chance, so, like, uh, say hi to her and meet her. But, um, you know, I think her husband also, like, she tried to work for the New York and her husband also did stuff, but, you know, she became the breadwinner. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, yeah, you've done this, and this is the most recent book you did, right? Pretty and Ink? Pretty and Ink. Yeah, so what is this, this? This was also another history? Well, it's a revised and, I think, final history of women cartoonists in which I've finally, you know, I don't know, you know, I'll, I'll probably be, be just making discoveries for the rest of my life, but I, I've done enough of these histories so that this is my final history. Mm -hmm. um, and I, more discoveries, I mean, in this book I found the first and perhaps still the only Native American woman cartoonist who do a darling strip. She was a whack in the 40s. Oh, wow. She did a great strip for the whack newspapers. Wow. Um, so I keep making discoveries. Yeah, that's, 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 um, we need that. And there you go. That mm. was, what, that was, it was kitchen, kitchen that sink. That must have been, I was like, only Dennis Kitchen would make buttons, so. Uh-huh, yeah. that's Kitchen Sink, yeah. Yeah. So, so Trina, what are you, what are you up to now? You mentioned your biography. I have four books coming out in 2017, which is really ridiculous even <laughs> for me. Um, one of them is the, is the reprint of Dope mm -hmm. that I mentioned. Uh, you know, I had serialized it in Eclipse, and it's being... Uh, reprinted in graphic novel form by a company called It's Alive! Exclamation point. Um, one of them is my memoir. Um, one of them is the work of, I'm still being a historian, the work of four women cartoonists who drew comics during the war years. And what they drew were beautiful, courageous women who fought the Axis and didn't need to be rescued by some guy. One of them is Lily. It's Lily Renee, Fran Hopper, both of whom worked for Fiction House, Barbara Hall, and Jill Elgin, who worked for Harvey Comics, mm. and did this great, Nobody remembers this fabulous comic. It was called Girl Commandos, and it's like a regular United Nation of women fighting the, the Axis. The, uh, the leader is Pat Parker, uh, who is, is British, and the Girl Commandos are an American, a Brit, a Russian woman, and a Chinese woman. And wow. it's, it's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, oh, there's, yeah, there's a lot to, so wait, is that, that's three Oh, books. that's three, okay. One more. The last one, all right. This um, just needs a little bit of pre-story to explain this, okay? Um, my father came to the United States at the age of 16. He grew up in a little village in Bela what is now Belarus, what was then just Russia. And those villages were called shtetls. It was where the Jews lived, uh, because the Tsar only allowed Jews to live in certain places. So he grew up in this shtetl. And he came to America at 16. And he wrote. He was a writer, but he wrote in Yiddish, which means he wrote for the Yiddish language newspapers in New York, which means he was paid very little, very like underground comics. Um, 
And in 1938, he wrote a book. And the book was in Yiddish, so I never read it. And <laughs> as a kid, as a kid, I resented the fact that he wrote in Yiddish because I wanted to be American. And that just was, it was too foreign. I didn't want it, you know. Mm. So I didn't pay attention. Um, okay, years go by, and he's dead, and I figure the book, we will never see this book. It's gone. How obscure can you get? But I happen to have a daughter who's a much better daughter than I was. <laughs> and she found the book on the internet. Wow. And it's been reprinted. So I bought a whole bunch of copies, and I had it translated. And when I read the translation, I said, this is a graphic novel. It consists of short pieces, almost like verbal snapshots, but very funny, um, of the people in, in his little village. And uh, they're all older people, because you know, he was a kid at the time. And, and they are quite irreverent, to put it mildly. Right. Um, think of Fiddler on the Roof. Think of Isaac Bashiva Singer. Think of Chagall. I oh, definitely nice. thought of Chagall. <laughs> In fact, I, I really wanted Chagall to do the cover, but he was unavailable. <laughs> so the cover is being drawn, has been drawn by Willie Mendez, oh, nice. who was there was a time when Willie and I were the only two women drawing comics in San Francisco. And if you look at It Ain't Me, Babe, I would say that it's half drawn by me and half drawn by Willie, and then, and then a whole, that other section in the middle, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so she did the cover. Um, and I have divided it into 12 chapters, 12 separate chapters, and I have 12 artists drawing it. It's being published by Bedside Press. The publisher is Hope Nicholson. It's Canada. Hope Nicholson is an amazing she woman. She is great. Isn't she? She Isn't is she? so cool. I love her. And she is the one who published Margaret Atwood's graphic novel, which is brand new. Yeah, yeah. So she's, yeah, she's definitely, you know, my oh the, my father's book ah um uh, okay the title in yiddish is aminyan yidden un andere sachen which mm -hmm. i translate as a bunch of jews and other stuff <laughs> <laughs> um listen we're running out of time if anybody has some questions uh but you have to come to the mic how about questions for trina if anybody oh no come on oh there we go yeah come on um, first, hi, I'm Linda uh, Redmond. Um, my first is just a comment. I think guys, including publishers, said women don't read comics because they didn't want us in the club. Oh, we yeah. had a boys club, and that was their way of brushing us off. So Definitely. This, uh, this place has been a revelation to me, real exciting. Um, during the 40s, I'm in 50s, and I can't remember from your book, were women paid to sit at the same rate as, say, a fiction house? It, would they pay women the same as men at that time, or was it different? You know, I actually do not know, but I'm kind of guessing that during the war they paid the women the same as the men. They needed them. Well, I ask that because in, in some situations, even during the war, women weren't paying to, paid the same during the war. So... Um, you know. It's very possible. This is something I don't know. I could look into it. It's, I didn't even think about that. Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Thanks. You know, that we're, you know that Kathy and I are huge fans. Um, I seem to remember that um, quite some years ago, you did a, an animated kids uh, computer storyline. Um, could you talk about that a little bit? And was, have you researched the women cartoonists in the animation world much? I haven't researched women in animation. It was very limited animation. It was for Harcourt Brace Jovanovich. It was for an educational thing with very simple animation. Um, it was called the series. The heroine of the series was called Rita Ready Reader. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was for young kids about reading. And she was kind of based on Mary Marvel. And the, in fact, the, the editor who hired me liked Mary Marvel, and he liked what I did, and he figured I could do a good job. Uh, I was thinking about something It was like Hawaii with a tiki. Oh, you're thinking of the first what computer game that? for girls. <laughs> that was, what, was, what year was that? That must have been the late 90s, I think. Okay. 
Uh, yeah, somebody is writing about that finally, by the way. I, I didn't know at the time that it was the first video game for girls. You know, um, this very nice company in Canada called Sanctuary Woods hired me to do this. It was called Hawaii High. And it was a computer game, but it was also limited animation, very limited, you know. Um, Didn't that come on a CD-ROM or something? It, yeah. It, yeah, you can't yeah. play it anymore. Yeah. Nobody has, has the capabilities of playing this thing anymore. Yeah. I have about five boxes of it. <laughs> useless, <laughs> useless. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome, thank you. Yeah, any, any other questions for Trina? So. Just a, a very little question. Um, you were talking about like being the pioneer of uh, women drawing comics in, in the States, but I was wondering if you are aware of, of the same kind of things in other countries. I can think in Mexico, uh, Yolanda Vargas Duche is like a very important name. Uh, in France, I'm sure also they have at the same time. Um, there was a time when I knew lots of the, the French and Italian and British women cartoonists back in the 70s because there was this wonderful publication that lasted, oh, I can't remember how many years it lasted, six or seven issues, Anana. Oh, it was published yeah. in France by the publishers of, of Metal Hurlant, which translated as heavy metal in the United States. And it was an all, it was an international all woman comic magazine. So there were women from every country in Europe and America. I was honored to be one of the contributors. So I knew those women. And for quite a while, I, I knew the, I still know more about the British women who are drawing yeah. comics. Um, I was at a convention in Monterey, Mexico, and there were tons of women there and they were so talented. I mean, I only know now what I see, I was at a convention also in Brazil, and these, I was in a room full of women cartoonists, and they were amazing, their work was amazing. Yeah, I mean, in, in uh, you know, in Italy, they have like, you know, the school of, of cartooning where they, they do the Disney style stuff, and I know a lot of women have graduated from there. You know, just it's, um, I mean, this would be like a gigantic, I'm sure if anyone wanted to do the same oh, yeah. level, I mean, we have Trina to tell us about our history, so unfortunately we need to, you know, uh, get, get the foreign Trinas, you know, or, or even a Trino, I mean, a, you know, a guy could do this too, you know, <laughs> um, the Trino, there you go. Um, like yeah, yeah. Any anyone anyone else out there? So uh, but we're we're just about running out of time. But and, 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 yeah, one there more. we go. One more. Yeah. Is there uh, any writers or artists doing uh, female writers and artists doing work today whose stuff that you're particularly like? I mean, it sounds like you're very busy at, with all of your uh, the projects that you're writing. But is there anybody whose stuff that you're like, oh, I never miss stuff by them? Can you? Make that a little clearer. Okay. So any female writers or artists in comics today who you're particularly interested who in? Anybody? I like? Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. I mean I was just in you know, I was just in the main room here seeing so much good stuff by women that it it boggles the mind. I mean there used to be a time when you could you know, you could count the women on one hand and then it got even better, you could count the women on two hands. Mm -hmm. Now it's just you know, it's, and there's more all the time, you know, so I really actually cannot name one particular woman. A recent book that I read that I absolutely loved was Nimona, if you haven't read that, but there's many more than that. You know, that just comes to my mind because I just read it. Yeah, and you know, every single uh, educator I talk to who teaches comics now, as I'm sure you know, they're like, oh yeah, most of my classes are girls. Mm -hmm. And I mean, they, they you know, are spreading out over the world. It's like uh, John Knox, you know, and the, the trumpet call of the, the terrible army of women, you know? Oh, I love that. <laughs> yeah, so. It, it's a revolution. It's it a is. genuine it revolution. Is. And, uh, you know, and the great part for us who, you know, fought, especially you, especially Trina. I mean, she's been on the front line for so long and done such amazing work as you've seen is that comics have never been more popular or yes. more important. Well, so. that's because there's so much more now than guys with big chins and too many muscles punching <laughs> each other out, you know? <laughs> well, on that note, uh, please join me in thanking Trina. For and thank this. you. Thank you.